just like the Atkins diet. Yep. What that comes down to, people think it's like a thing, but it's really just calories in, calories out. Yep. And for most people, 80% of their calories comes from carbs. Carbs are not an enemy. It's just that for most people, they're going to lose weight because your average person doesn't eat breakfast, yep. eats a bagel around yeah. brunch time, and then they'll eat a pound of pasta at night. Okay. So yeah, if you get rid of your lunch and your dinner, you're going to lose weight. He was present on January 6th, and th this led to it. So it's just not true. You know, what were you doing there January 6th is, is going to be one of my questions. So so start thinking yeah. about that one, Pat. Now I can All say right. what the fuck I want because we are doing this through a computer and you're not right next to me. So, so I might talk a little shit. Welcome to 2000% Raise, hosted by the man who took down billion dollar companies while sitting at his kitchen table. John Sarasani. Let that big job in my 20s to become an entrepreneur. Everyone said I would fail, but I got winner in my core. So my company need a private equity and the money poured. I got millions times lower. Not bad for a kid from Schomburg, right? You know, a couple months ago, I had a really good conversation with UFC OG Pat Militich, and we got into a lot more than just the MMA stuff. This guy is a nutrition wizard. He just wants to live till he's 100 years old. And he knows the formula on exactly how to do it, according to him. And, you know, I didn't air that episode because I ended season one. And I was going to fold Pat back in sometime in season two because it was such a great conversation. Then sure enough, Philadelphia-based trainer um, Andrew Hurst uh, enters the scene. And him and I have a great, great conversation live in the studio in Las Vegas. So... I've now just taken a step back and said, you know what? We got to do this shit on the same episode. You two guys are dropping bombs. So welcome to the health and wellness episode. We start with Andrew. I want to talk a little bit about my historical weight loss journey before I bring out our first guest. Um, he's a personal trainer and uh, is doing really good things with some high profile athletes and made some... Uh, Pretty good statistics that we'll be sharing as well, but let me start off by just reminding everybody that I played football in college, okay? And you're trained as a football player, especially a tight end that I played, trying to get as big and as strong as you possibly could be while keeping your feet and being able to run too. Well, what happens is in doing that, you know, you're eating a lot, you're taking in a lot of calories. Well, eventually your football days come to an end. And you better adjust your diet because you're not working out three hours a day anymore. And uh, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. And, you know, I played tight end at around 265 pounds in college and found myself on the scale when I was 25 years old at 296 pounds. I'll never forget it. Got these damn New Year's Eve pictures back. Didn't even recognize myself. At the time, the Atkins diet was becoming the thing. Everyone was talking about the Atkins diet. This is back in... 2003 ish. And I read that book cover to cover. I will go toe to toe with anybody about Atkins diet, about low carb lifestyle and all that shit, all the stuff that's coming out nowadays, the keto diet and it used to be the South beach diet. It's all ripoffs of the Atkins diet. All right. Now I know a lot of health. And, I know a lot of health people will challenge me on that. And my first thing I ask them is, did you guys read the actual book? Most people never actually read the book. You're supposed to incorporate carbs over time. You just keep them out of your diet in the first few weeks. Anyway, it worked like a charm. I got down to 230 pounds, was feeling great, um, and really stayed in that 230 to 240 range for the next 20 years. I fluctuated a little bit from time to time um, because I would just keep my eye off the ball. The problem with me has always been the damn alcohol. And we'll be ask, asking my guests today about this too. The alcohol is always a problem. Any diet, <laughs> alcohol fucks that shit up, all right? And especially if you're doing low carb because you're dehydrating your body, then you take in some vodka and it's not necessarily the vodka itself. It's that next morning trying not to go eat a fucking McGriddle. That was always my issue at least, all right? So without further ado, I'm gonna bring on a personal trainer. He has a company out of Philadelphia called Base Training. And him and I have known each other on social media for some time now. He's come to a couple of my events and uh, really became friends with him. Like, dude, we got to give you a platform on this show, man. You're saying some shit right now. I see all these fitness gurus online, and he has an opinion of those guys, too. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so much. But everything that comes out of this guy's mouth has been pretty damn intelligent in all my conversation with, conversations with him. 
Andrew Hurst, welcome to 2000% Raise. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. <laughs> Glad to be here, buddy. <laughs> what do you think of our Vegas studio, man? It's not yeah, bad. Yeah, it's right? uh, pretty killer. So that's yeah. uh, it's yeah. just always crazy, you know, in the fitness world especially, is these influencers think they have to, like, anybody can just, like, get a microphone and right. just get in their mom's basement and start yep. talking about whatever. And, you know, there's a famous personal trainer, and he's a Ph.D., he, uh, his name's uh, Lane Norton, okay. and he just debunks all. So, like, he does, because he has the academic credentials, he does yeah. he does my dirty work for, so people will listen to him. Yeah. And he's good looking and all the things. Yeah. And uh, and so he, he does, <laughs> he, like, so if there's a podcast yeah. out there, yeah. he, he works full time debunking these guys. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, so let's, well, why don't we start right there, man? Okay, so, so, so one of the things that I've noticed that with the business influencers, at least, right, mm -hmm. Is that they can't believe half the shit they're f fucking saying. They have to be saying some of this wild shit mm -hmm. just purely for views and likes. And I gotta think, I got a 15 year old son, man, and he's coming up with these new exercises, these new workouts all the damn time because he read this shit in some magazine. I go, listen, bud, you know why they're fucking, you, you know why they're writing that article? Mm -hmm. Because if they tell you to bench and squat and power clean, right. no one's gonna read it because everyone freaking knows that. You don't go do calf raises and fucking Saigon squats or some all this crazy shit he's doing. I go, just bench and squat, son. That's what I tell him. And he don't listen to me though. And so literally that's why I, so my company base stands for Basic Advanced Scientific Exercise okay. because it's so advanced because it's mm -hmm. science. So it's based on actual like algorithms. Yeah. And and sign uh, physics equations. Yep. And it's so advanced that it's basic because you can't undo just like the Atkins diet. Yep. What that comes down to, people think it's like a thing, but it's really just calories in, calories out. Yep. And for most people, eighty percent of their calories comes from carbs. Okay. So it's not that carbs is an enemy. Carbs are not an enemy. It's just that for most people, they're going to lose weight because your average person doesn't eat breakfast. Yep. Eats a bagel around yeah. brunch time, and then they'll eat a pound of pasta at night. Okay. So yeah, if you get rid of your lunch and your dinner, you're gonna lose weight because you're taking in less calories. Right. See, I've had a lot, a lot of people say that to me, and it, what, what's interesting about it, though, here's what I'll say, though, what I've noticed at least by not having carbs in your system as well, though, you you don't have like it's like an insulin rush or something you oh, get that gives you the cravings, right? By yeah. not having carbs, it makes you not hungry. Yeah, you're too. not so crashing. Right. It all snowballs the right direction, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, it is science-based, but that's people always, and to the point of, like, your son is people always want a sex, they, they, they think it's a sexy, like, dopamine hit. Yep. But they're not realizing, they're thinking it's working, yeah. and your average person, again, to the point of, like, your whole brand, mm -hmm. corporate America thinking yep. is... Uh, a, a standard phrase that I love in, in my world, especially New Year's time, yeah. is uh, when people say, oh, it always works for me. Yeah. Well, if it always worked for you, then you would be in shape. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> just going off the rails here, too, yeah. years ago, I used to run a um, testosterone replacement therapy. Uh-oh, I want to ask you about that, actually. Go ahead. And I was just, you know, leading into the podcast because we, we were touching on it. Um, I looked up the website and I left the company in 2013. Okay. And they now do what's called a love shot. All right. And what that means is the takeaway there is that if you're on testosterone treatment, it's a mm. for most people, it's a once a week shot. Okay. Once a week, and your average dude can't even keep up that schedule. <laughs> and so now they have to go to the doctor to get the love shot. Yeah. And use insurance and all these things. And it's yeah. just even if it's the answer, yeah. your average person still just can't. Do it. Well, I have a couple of friends. I'm in my 40s. I have a couple of friends that that kind of swear by this testosterone replacement stuff. And yeah. I guess there's like a pellet you could put like in your backside. So that's that's why I ultimately got out of the field. Mm -hmm. uh, aside from the fact that your average client, um, again, to the point of corporate America, your whole brand mm -hmm. is these guys. You know, they become Southeast Regional Director, <laughs> and then they, you know, without fail, they all got divorced at like 41. Yeah, give away half their stuff. Yeah, so now they think they're at the top of the income scale, but they just lost their entire life savings. Right. And and they go in to get the testosterone. And then the reason they go with the pellet is because it's covered by insurance. Okay. And so, you know, breaking it all the way down through the scientific aspect mm -hmm. was you want to go on the bioidentical hormone, which is mm -hmm. just a shot. Okay. 
but they the doctors sell it because mm -hmm. they're getting paid by the insurance companies. Got it. So they kind of passively create fear, and they'll ask the questions. Yeah. In a funny way, they'll be like, are you scared of needles? Because mm -hmm. it is a needle. It's intramuscular. <laughs> okay. Um, but the pellet is patentable, and that's what I'm getting, getting oh. back to. And okay. so that was the biggest reason I walked away from it was the first company to do it big, coincidentally, it's a Vegas company, mm -hmm. is called Cinegenics. Okay. And this was like early 2000s during the big real estate boom. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, it was $15,000 a year. They send you Rolls Royce. They bring you in the whole caboodle. Really? And that's how I got into it was um, my business partners were a plastic, he was a plastic surgeon. And he was one of the Cinegenics first customers. Okay. And so the private money world validated that it was a thing. Okay. Got it. And I always, in, in the business world, I always use it, um, the coach handbag mm -hmm. business yeah. as, a, as a model. So coach handbags was a luxury item. Yep. Then it became... A mass-produced luxury item mm -hmm. and then because the rich so the rich people had it and then the kind of rich people wanted it yeah and then because the kind of rich people had it the actually rich people didn't want it right and then they had to figure out how to serve the masses okay and so that's where we are and then they put coach handbags in the outlets yeah and that's where and that was the demise and then they got bought by tapestry yeah but I digress but by, by the way I bought a girl a coach bag when in like 2014 for Christmas and it's mm -hmm. like 900 bucks and I thought it was a great gift and she yeah. kind of like laughed at me yeah. like well, uh, <laughs> you're so frugal John for a guy that makes as much money as you go yeah. shit we broke up like two days yeah. later so to that end I've, as is John's got these new hats they say self-made on them <laughs> and so our first year my, I'm married to my college sweetheart yeah. and uh our first Christmas together was when first real Christmas together was when coach handbags were huge okay and I was saving 50 percent of my income I was making eighteen thousand dollars a year where I'm saving 9,000. I was like, if I just max out the Roth yeah. IRA, I'll be retired at 35. Like, that was my goal. Yeah, it's not going to happen. And, you know, all of her girlfriends were like, yeah. if you're all this well-to-do, like, if you're mentally driven to be rich, like, being right. rich is a, as a mentality. It's not right, right. just about the money. Yeah. And so I was so driven into saving, but my then-girlfriend was like, you know, where's, where's my coach bag? Yeah. So I went to Macy's, signed up for the credit card. Okay. And like, triple stack coupons. Uh-huh. And fast forward twenty years, and now we still have that coach bag. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to forget where I came from. Yeah, right, uh, but now it's go. in my kids' playroom. <laughs> like that's there when they dress that's up, funny. they wear coach bags. Yeah. All right, so let's tie this back into the testosterone. Then. Yeah. So you're saying, okay, so so the super rich or they're putting fifteen grand to put the pellet in your ass, saying it's a miracle drug when really it was just a slow release testosterone. No, no, that's what I'm saying. So at the fifteen grand, uh -huh. it was bioidentical testosterone. Oh. And those guys are all still on it. Okay. Because that's what separates the the good from the great. I see. They're still willing to do it. Got the it. middle middle class or yeah. the middle upper class is now onto the pellets and the yeah. and the love shots which and is whatever. Like, which is probably like fifteen hundred or two grand a year or something. Yeah, I don't yeah. I don't even know what it is anymore. Yeah. And then um you know, mm -hmm. to the middle class they're using creams and stuff and got whatever. it. Okay. Um so, me personally I take terrestris tribulus uh -huh. or tribulus terrestris and it's just over the counter um it's a plant. Yeah. And obviously, again, you know, to the point of uh, debunking stuff, is yeah. because it's a plant yeah. and it's not patentable because it's a plant, just yeah. like Ephedra back in the day. I mean, right. Ephedra was huge when you played college football. Yeah. See, so they ban it because it's not patentable. Dude, I take Ephedra and not be able to sleep for two days. Yeah. Like, Who needs blow. to blink? It's like, don't blow. So I've heard. Yeah. Um, so TRT, though, like, <laughs> here's my tell all set. If somebody has low testosterone levels and needs to take TRT and takes mm -hmm. enough to a point where it gets them at normal levels, hey, that's fucking cool. Absolutely. But like, listen, motherfucker, you're 44. You just happened to get divorced last year, like you were saying. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you're more ripped than you ever were in your right. 20s. You were never this big your whole life. You're abusing the TRT, yeah. which is basically, oh, I don't do steroids. I just do TRT. Yeah, but if you take quadruple the recommended dose, you're doing steroids. So that's the hardest thing, being a, an, an actual college educated personal trainer is mm -hmm. I compete against in you know social media world mm -hmm. is TRT they can take testosterone but your average dose for a normal size guy like a guy your size mm -hmm. they were on therapy so the range is 300 to 1200 on, in regard to the testosterone level so if you're reading your your blood it's 300 to 1200 so like a 16 year old boy like your your son should be at a, about a thousand to 1200 okay um, high level can go like 1600 okay and so for a you know a guy in his 40s should be mm -hmm. around 700. Okay. You can comfortably go to 1500. Okay. 
And then, you know, to tell my own personal story was when I was running the, uh, the testosterone replacement uh, firm, I went on it in my late twenties because I, mm. you know, how could I, how could I shill it, so mm. to speak? Right. How could I sell this if I'm not going to be on it? Yep. And and I cheated, and I, you know, because I didn't need it, need it. Yeah. <laughs> but the reason I don't do it, and to your point, is I think it serves a significant purpose. Mm-hmm. Is being on testosterone, I can be totally fine on four hours of sleep, mm. but I just feel like that's not. Mm. A good idea right and so i don't like the way i feel because you just have so much energy yeah i can it, see that if you don't need it like you know i didn't gamble last night with you for yeah. if i had been on testosterone i i would still be awake from then <laughs> so if I you feel, don't yeah. need it but it is a miracle drug and that's you know my dad's 75 or 74 he's been on it for 13 years and okay. he feels so much better doing it mm-hmm. you know the, the big knock on it is that it causes an enlarged heart oh um but he's like, if I die at 86 after 20 years of health, mm-hmm. of, a, of a massive heart attack, I'd rather do that than be broken down till 93. <laughs> so funny. it totally serves a purpose. But yeah. you know, in the fitness influencer world, there's a there's a guy out there. He runs Superhuman. His name's John Madsen. He's a great guy. Okay. Uh, but to your point of like cheating, is he makes all of his clients be on testosterone? Really? And that's like. You know, if I'm I'm 38 years old, like I don't need it. Well, the reason I never went there was because it, once you get going on it, your body shuts, yeah. stops producing its own, right? Yeah. So, like, if you like, if you take it, you better like be done having kids and shit, probably, right? So that's the other thing. I mean, if yeah. you gain the muscle, like all the fitness influencers that take it, yep. Um, you know, they're probably so. That's where I was going with it. So a guy your mm-hmm. size at most would be taking one ml, one milliliter mm-hmm. a, a week, mm-hmm. which is normal. Yeah. They're taking two to four milliliters. Nuts. So they're going to be shredded. Yeah. But your your testicles shrivel up. Yeah. They're just gone. Well, dude, I'm going to tell you what, man. Like, people don't realize, too. If you get, like, I, I've learned this as I've gotten older now. I, you can't keep, like, weight lifting. Like, you, you, you're, if you, if you, if your muscles get too big for your damn body. Yeah. I was 38 years old doing sets of 315 bench yeah. eight times. Like I'm going to be on the fucking Cowboys next year or something. What the fuck am I doing? Okay. And finally it caught up to me. So I see these dudes that are all fucking jacked in their 40s and see them at the damn gym. And you could tell their frame isn't big enough for what they're trying to do. They're going to end up pulling a bicep or something, right? So that, exactly. And that's why, again, my company's called Base is um, super long story, but I the gym that I went to, I tore my arm playing baseball mm-hmm. as a kid. Yeah. And the gym that I went to just so happened to be um it was originally called Mainline Nautilus. Mm. So it was the first Nautilus gym in America. Okay. And so he ended up being my mentor. Long story short, I did my internship there under him and he was the uh head judge for the IFBB bodybuilding back in the day. Okay. And the Nautilus way of training is twice a week. Yeah. And if you're uh, playing if you're playing pro sports or high level sports, it's once a week, mm. and you train to failure. Yep. And so, same thing with the coach handbag. Same psychology as the coach handbag. Yep. It's the hardest thing in my career that I've had to do is fight against my generation. Got it. When cro- like, I graduated in 07 from college. 08 CrossFit mm. hits. Yep. And that yep. everybody wanted to do it. Right. Because every girl that I graduated college with started running marathons. And then every single dude was like, oh, well, we can do this together. So, we can hang out. So let's talk about that kind of – so CrossFit still exists. I'm going to throw some different you, – you, you, you tell me if it's here to stay or if it's uh, gone, all right? Mm-hmm. Um, Zumba. It's here to stay. Okay. Yeah. As long as Skechers or Sneakers, Zumba's going to be a thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. the, the, the Zumba ladies, it never took off. Like, it was always a thing. Yep. But the core ladies, they still go. Okay. Hot yoga. Uh, it's driving up now with the sauna. Like, all the influencers are saying how to, you know, do the cold plunge and do the sauna. Yep. Again, it comes back to consistency. So, the people that like hot yoga, like one of my clients, Brian Baldinger, mm-hmm. you know, NFL guy. So... Again, he strength trains with me twice a week, mm-hmm. but then he would good, do hot yoga two or three times a week. Nice. Okay. So, All right. Here's a curveball for you. How about independent gyms? I'm seeing this emergence of the big box gyms kind of taking over now. And let me give you a quick example. A guy has a boxing gym in my hometown. He's, mm-hmm. he's a Walter, Walter weight championship or something a couple of years ago. He does MMA stuff there and he has a little weight room in there and shit like that too. And I tried to sign up and start going there all the damn time, but I wanted the bench. I wanted the damn squat. And 
the equipment there is not the same as the equipment at Lifetime Fitness or the right. equipment at, you know, Bailey's or, or not, Bailey's is a bad example, but Lifetime Fitness is, is where I go. And it's like, dude, these independent guys, man, it's going to be so hard for them well, to it, compete. It is. Well, it is. And it just depends on, you know, we were talking about uh, John and I apparently both had read the book Raving Fans. Yeah. It's, it's why is that trainer there? If they yeah. have a following. Yeah. I mean, if you can't convince 10 people. Mm hmm to follow you and to go to your gym, then you probably shouldn't be in the business. So that's what you see. So you know what? And I think he gets about this guy particularly, which I'm sure is indicative of a bunch of guys like him. They, they do have a following. It's the one-on-one -on -one stuff where he's making mm -hmm. his money and he does have that following. But mm -hmm. you get these, like I go sign up for a lifetime fitness member membership. Mm -hmm. They're up my ass like a freaking telemarketer is trying to get me to come in and do a free consultation, mm -hmm. a free tour of the gym. And it's all just trying to get me upsold with personal trainers. Yeah. And I, I got to think that the personal trainers at the lifetime fitnesses of the world eventually kind of graduate to going out on their own and don't stay there for their whole career. Is that, would you agree with that? So literally to the point of your whole, so right now in your average personal trainer lives at home mm -hmm. or is moving back in. Yep. All the major chains are jacking up their prices mm -hmm. and slashing the trainer pay. Okay. But that type of millennial is, you know, they, they did everything right according. So they went to college, mm -hmm. did all the things. Yep. And now they're all panicking. I've had a job posting up for $90 an hour mm. for two years, three yeah. years now. Yeah. I've had three applicants. One girl showed up and then she ghosted me. Mm. Is it's They don't believe that they're worthy of success and mm. they'd rather, <laughs> you'll love this one. So the other day... Um, at Christmas time at my old gym that I was at, my last corporate gym, mm. is they had a hundred percent turnout for yeah. pajama day. <laughs> so they gave pay cuts after COVID to all go. the trainers. Yeah. But they had a hundred percent but because they're all failing together, yeah, it's yeah. comfortable. Oh my God. That's funny. So but that's, that's where we are. You know, you just made me think of something there. I kind of <laughs> just had a little uh a little epiphany in my own mind there, I guess, right? So you get that 24 year old, that 25 year old that's been in the workforce for a couple of years, maybe making 40 or 50 grand. They hate their job though. They hate their cubicle. They hate their boss. Something goes mm -hmm. sideways mm -hmm. and they decide instead of looking for a new job in a white collar type industry, you know what? Fuck this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go be a personal fucking trainer. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I don't know. I, I got to think like, yeah, that's a great idea. You better be like, you're, we are 38 years old. Mm -hmm. So you're into it. This is your deal. Yeah. You probably got 25 year olds that think it's going to be their deal, but yeah. it's only because you're 25 and you like this shit still. You're not going to like it in five years. You well, know, again, again, to the point of like doing this podcast is, you know, we're physically in Vegas and so many of my trainer peers and colleagues yeah, yeah. were like, why are you flying out? You can just like zoom in mm -hmm. and uh, got to show up. And so one of my NFL clients, he always, He's like, oh, I have this guy, but like everybody has a trainer guy. Yep. So when people are like, oh, who do you train with? And so everyone's like, oh, this is Bob. He's a landscaper and a personal trainer. <laughs> and uh, exactly. So where I was going with that is the fact that I got on the plane is the same reason on social media, to your point of like who gets yeah. into the world. Into right. the, it's so easy to become a credentialed personal trainer. Yeah. As long as you're good looking, mm -hmm. have an addictive personality, and are gregarious, yeah. you can you can sell. See, and, and that's the other damn thing I think about. This is why I, I never do it. It's because I feel like the personal trainers, and I see them in the damn gym, all right? They're always doing this like bizarre, crazy shit because you're not going to go pay a personal trainer to sit there and watch you bench press. So so stand in this corner and do this with ropes for 20 right. minutes, and I'm going to scream in your ear. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's better than fucking regular biceps, right? Like, yeah. like Is that part of it, though? Part of it is you making it so it's not you know, the same thing over and over. You want to keep it interesting. So that 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 40 something that shows up that maybe wasn't a former athlete that's trying to get in shape, man or man or woman, right? Mm -hmm. Like they don't have it in them to do this on their own. They right. can't keep to a routine. So you gotta keep things fresh and exciting for them. Is that is that half your job, would you say? That's that's probably about twenty percent of my job. But mm -hmm. to that end, like I have twenty six machines in my gym. Okay. And Again, it goes back to base training. It's basic. Mm. It's yeah. boring. Yeah. It's not sexy. We don't use ropes. We don't do mm. cardio. It's yeah. boring. It's the same rotation of like I'll do 14 machines and then rotate them. So, yeah. but you're doing the same 26 things. 
So you talk a lot about something called the uh, golden triangle. Yeah. And uh, I, I, when I first heard you say it, I thought you were just kind of regurgitating a concept that's that's out there. And I fully it, made it up. It's an original one from you. So <laughs> yeah, why don't you g give us that overview? And then before we end here, I want to get into some of the results you've had with um, some of your high profile folks. So, you know, to, the, to John's brand is so many people, like my dad retired at 44. So that's my personal take on it. And so that's just my truth. It's mm -hmm. the way I grew up. Yeah. And... Um, so the golden triangle is money is one thing and then you have your relationship and then you have your health. Mm. And so many guys focus on one of those, yeah. you know, society at large says, Oh, you, you made all the money. Right. Like my country club has all these guys have money, yeah. but they're always at the country club yeah. without their wife and just hanging in a group <laughs> of dudes. Like one guy has been there. I see him every time I'm there. Yeah. I, I've known him for seven years. I've never met his wife. Okay. And it's like, why? What, right. What's going on? And uh, and none of them are in shape. Okay. But that's so that's the golden triangle is you got to have all three, and that's yeah. where it goes back. And to what are like the what are the three? Relationship, health, and money. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and they should all be equal. Oh, well, it depends what's important to you. Okay. I mean, that's you know somebody like Elon Musk. But they all have to connect in some way. Yeah. So it might be it might be an acute triangle. Yeah. Or, or quadrilateral. Or, like, exactly. I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I don't, I don't know if triangles that, could be quadrilaterals. Yeah. Isosceles. I don't know. Isosceles. Yeah. Well, rhombus. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's the golden rhombus. A circle, a circle. A circle. Okay. Yeah, there we go. For just naming any shape. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it is a it is a cool concept though, man. If you ever write a book, I think you could put like three chapters on just that alone that's, when you really hash it out. I have to have coherent thoughts to. Uh, yeah. My brain just goes a mile a minute. And yeah. And know the difference between a quadrilateral and a triangle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. it's on the fly, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned Brian Balding earlier, yeah. and I, I got a chance to, uh, when we were at our Philadelphia event, I was at uh, an Eagles game, and a very, very popular, he might not be a household name nationally, but he's definitely a household name in Philadelphia, and people that follow NFL should know who this guy is, Hollis Thomas, very, very popular um, former Eagle. And um, I got to tell you, man, I was hanging out with this guy, and he's a big he, he's a big dude right now. And and what's he he could he spoke the world to you, by the way. He couldn't stop complimenting you. And then I told you, yeah, he's a big motherfucker. And you're like, you should have seen him before I started working with him. Yeah, so I mean, that goes back to the the golden rhombus here. Um, <laughs> when Hollis retired, coincidentally, he lived. Or no, he he was in Vegas, and then he lived in Texas. Uh -huh. um, you know, he made twenty. It's public knowledge. Made twenty million plus in his career. Yeah. Um, he had two acres, had a go-kart track at his house, like mm -hmm. yeah. living the life. And, but he was, when he started with me, he was uh, 460 pounds. Wow. And what did he play at? 350-ish? He played at like 325. Okay. He's but he had to be like chubby. So his big thing was so He's that, a nose guard, right? Or tackle? Tackle. Tackle. And, uh, but he said the, to get hits at his size, he would bruise too much if he got too lean. Oh. So he had to like carry fat. Yeah. Um, so his story was we took him from 460 down to 305, I think it was. And then when he got, and then he ballooned back up a little bit. And then fun, fun tidbit here was he got cast to be on The Biggest Loser. Okay. And then he went out there for final testing and to the point of commercial gyms everywhere is he didn't have a sob story. Uh -huh. You know, he was like African-American from, from the hood in uh, St. Louis. And they're like, oh, so like you didn't know your dad? He's like, uh, no, actually, my parents are together, and my dad was a very influential part in my life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, but you you don't know your siblings? Uh, actually, I love them all. Um, yeah. Did anybody die? Nope. Yeah. Uh, are your parents still poor? No, they're not. Um, you know, we're a yeah, successful family. Were, we yeah. all grew together. Yeah. And they're like, oh, well, and it's like, well, how'd you lose all your weight with uh with your trainer? Did you do a lot of cardio? Did you do a lot of crash dieting? It's yeah. like, well, no, I train with Andrew uh, twice a week, yeah. and I strength train, and I don't do cardio. <laughs> and they're like, wait a minute, yeah. this isn't this isn't yeah. good television. But we need bizarre. So they we sent him out. Yeah, yeah, sent him on his way. So now he's like 360 and 19 percent body fat. Last I knew. Yeah. But he, um, one of my other clients owns uh, Philly Sports Trips, and then one of my other clients owns uh, the biggest bar, or like the top bar in our town. Yeah. And so he does appearances at all these things, and yeah. so he's a professional. Like, I don't want to say tailgater, but yeah. <laughs> like he is, yeah, the, he is a real life Philadelphia Eagles football right now. Well, I so, like, when you go, you, you want him, you want, you want him at your party, he's like, right. he, he's, he, he draws attention. So, that's you know, to the point of like drinking and alcohol and the Atkins diet, yeah, is he has to drink at these 
at oh, yeah. these events. And oh, yeah. no amount of cardio, no amount of rope <laughs> slamming, no amount of CrossFit yeah. is going to keep somebody that size in shape. Right. But that, that type of lifestyle is pretty normal. Well, dude, and it's in also corporate America. Well, and it's also you know just like what I was taught. You, you've trained as a football player. You've trained your body for so long to take in these Sam calories and to make yourself big, and just yeah. to turn that switch up. Like if you would have told me when I was in doing double sessions when I was 22 years old, yeah. 90 degree heat, and if you would have told me I have the choice of not working out and just eating right when I'm older, I won't have to do all this shit where I'm huffing yeah. and puffing and dying. I could just eat right. I would have thought this is the easiest thing in the world to do. Yeah. But after decades yeah. of trying to eat it. I can't just stop eating ice cream. Like yeah. this is very difficult, dude. And it's that, very difficult. It know? goes back to what you said. Like that's where I don't have to keep it interesting is because most people won't do it on their own. Mm. And so because it's so stinking simple, yep. that's where my value grows even more. Yep. And that's, you know, people are like in Hollis's case or Baldy's case, yeah. they played collectively in the NFL for 27 years. Right. Like they know how to train. Yeah, exactly. But they need me they yeah. all know how. Yeah, keep it. Fitness is free. Like, you can Google how to eat. You can do Google. Keep them the, honest. But you yeah. have to do it, and you yeah. need somebody to track you. Yeah. Just like I went to bed last night when... Yeah. We went, <laughs> to, the, we went to the craps table. We went to the craps table, <laughs> and I was like, I just can't do it. At that, uh, I just don't have that level. Oh, shit. That's but awesome. I'll, I'll party and have a good time, but I just... <laughs> you can't. That's pretty damn you gotta good. got to wrangle it back in. All right, man. Before we get to our last question here, brother, uh, let's tell everyone how to find you. Andrew Hurst, what, do you want to give them your Instagram? Uh, Instagram's base training seven, the number seven, mm -hmm. uh, based on when I was nine years old. I started this whole thing. When I was nine years old, I got Mickey Mantle's autograph at the Trump Taj Mahal. Okay. And it, I just became enamored with business because I remember pulling up. So my Trump dad. Trump Taj Mahal is Atlantic City? In Atlantic City. Yeah. And so my dad's from a, very close to where Mickey Mantle grew up in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma. Okay. And if Mickey Mantle could become Mickey Mantle yeah. from, from nowhere, anybody can be anything. So I'm nine years old thinking like, holy Toledo. But what really resonated, because the Taj Mahal, I grew up in the Middle East, and the Taj Mahal, and like obviously the actual Taj yeah. Mahal is a big thing <laughs> right. overseas. And uh, so I'm pulling up and I was just like, dad, who would, who would put the Taj Mahal? Yeah. on the side of their building yeah. and my dad's like a guy named donald trump yeah <laughs> and i was just like holy like yeah you know almost, not, almost. not talking about him politically but it's like yeah. right or wrong like the audacity to believe that you're gonna compete with the actual taj mahal yeah like this yep. is what you're building <laughs> and i was like wow okay all right yeah. Yep. And he's, you know. And so that ties into base training seven. That's uh, why I'm base training seven. Yep. Okay. Awesome. So that's why I'm lucky number seven. And then my website's base <laughs> oh, training. Oh, lucky number seven. Got it. Yeah. Uh, base, I wasn't connecting that dot there. Yeah. Like, okay. Base training mainline.com. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, welcome to Inside My Brain. <laughs> no problem. Rhombus. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, by the way, I wanted to bring another one up too. I, I'll go backwards for, for one second. All right. Remember the, the the women's fitness uh, place, Cur Curves? Curves. Yes. They're on every damn street That's corner. why Zumba will survive. Okay. So Curves just all of a sudden disappeared. And by the way, I have a strong opinion on franchises, by the way. Just because a franchise is everywhere doesn't mean any of those franchisees is making any damn money. The franchisor is probably making money off of the damn fees they're collecting, yeah. but they might be running deals or whatever. There's a low barrier of entry. Yeah. And in that case, get a bunch of probably middle-aged women yep. that want to get in shape anyway and don't want um, to go to a fucking powerhouse gym with a bunch of muscle heads, right? And, the and, now, that and went, now they're gone. And that's the reason that went under is so psychologically in the gym world, it's a, it's a catchphrase called wound buddies. Okay. And so when people have the same story you mm. know like that's why i started following you on instagram like we had a similar background yeah and it made me so you can choose to uh you know misery loves company right or you can grow together yeah like you can acknowledge your past and say hey that wasn't fun okay or you and you think curves was wound, and so, wound buddies? so it was a bunch of wound buddies where the franchisees <laughs> bought it but this is why they all went out of business is because they didn't want to charge their members because they always had a sob story. Okay. They're like, oh, I'll pay January when, oh, well, you know, I'm getting divorced. Gotcha. And because they had the empathy, like we all do it. So as their trainers. target audience was the mother of two that never lost the baby weight. Maybe she's getting divorced now. That was their target And then audience. they would bring their mom and then the okay. grandmoms were there and they'd have the grandma power hour. Okay. 
and they just didn't bill. Yeah. My, my guess would be that they got so popular fast because everything you just said. And also, I think that their gyms were very basic, like just, yeah. just a room. So you could probably start that thing up with pretty pretty low startup costs. Um, all right, man. We ask everyone the last, uh, last question on every show. Andrew Hurst of Base Training in the greater Philadelphia area rec- recommends what movie to the 2,000% raise audience? I got to go with what I watch on, on the flight here. I watched Forrest Gump. Okay. And A League of Their Own. All right. All those right. are my two go-tos. Haven't had either of those before. All right, yeah. man. You're awesome, buddy. Thank you, man. All right, John. Thanks for joining us. What's interesting about my guest today is if you're a Midwesterner, all right? Now we talk about Chicago. We talk about Chicago, okay? But Chicago is a big Midwest city. Most most cities around the Midwest are not like Chicago. Sure, you've heard of Detroit. Sure, you've heard of Indianapolis and St. Louis. Those are kind of like Chicago, like mini versions. But the Quad Cities on the border of Iowa and Illinois, I think really represents what a Midwest town or city looks like, all right? And, and, and Pat, don't don't chime in. I'm going to try to name the four Quad Cities. Uh, a lot of people screw this up. You got Moline. I know that because my buddy's a reverend at a, at a Methodist church there. Rob McCoy, shout out. Um, you got uh, Badendorf. You got, uh, I want to say East Moline, but I know it's not one. Probably should have researched this more. Shit, man. It'll come to me. Don't, don't say it. But there's two more. Anybody in the listening audience, you're saying it for me. You're yelling at your radios right now. You're yelling at your phones right now. I will, I will think of it as, as we go, but it's not East Moline. I could tell you that much. God, how did I not even have two? What's wrong with me? Jesus. Oh, Rock Island. That's another one. Yep. Hmm. Oh, now is it? You could chime in. Is it Davenport? Yeah. Oh, it is yeah. Davenport. Okay. Duh. Duh. So, <laughs> so you're a little younger than me. Yeah. Um, but back in the day, Dan Aykroyd, when he was on Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live, Played a male prostitute, <laughs> and he went to a lady's. Uh, some female he was hired by the corporation, uh, like John Deere or whatever. And he's got a really shitty looking suit on and a hat. And comes into her bedroom and into her hotel room and goes, "I'm here. Compliments of the company that you're meeting with." And uh, he looks at the camera and goes, "Because I'm Fred Garvin." Male prostitute. I service the entire Quad Cities area. But no damn poor guy with the police. <laughs> so he he lists all four of them. Okay, so oh, yeah, just memorize yeah. that scene and you got it. It's hilarious, dude. It's hilarious. Yeah, that does. Not not to spend too much time on this, but but do the people of East Moline kind of kind of feel left out? Is it like a thing? I think they. I think they do. I had cousins. I had Melissa's cousins over that went to East Moline High School and stuff. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. But you guys uh, are part of the great- quad. Stay over there. Stay on that side of the river, man. You're not part of the quad, bro. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, uh, but uh, it's interesting that you didn't get Rock Island right away because all the gangsters used to come to our town okay, uh, and hang out here. Like Al Capone was here all the time. Really? Okay. And then there was a famous, that now I'm losing, uh, I'll look him up here maybe, a famous gangster um, who... Al Capone had to ask him for permission to come here. Oh, okay. All right. This dude, this dude was hardcore. And what he would do, um, he was like the, he would have hookers go and like rub all over politicians and yep. he'd have photographers take pictures of the politician and he'd blackmail them. Boom. Boom. Crazy yeah, stuff. Dude. He knew what he was doing. And, and by the way, for anyone not in the Midwest, the reason you will ever know that a business has had Al Capone frequent it, you, you don't have to look it up. They'll tell you. There will be a sign at the door that Al Capone used to hang out here. It's it's like a weird thing about the Midwest, particularly Chicago, that uh, we're, we're, we're proud of having this notorious uh, criminal having frequented this establishment in the past. That's uh, I tell you what, Pat, I, I, I did a survey when I was in Europe. I go, you know what? Do people, what do people even think of when they think of Chicago? But do people even know what the hell Chicago is in Europe? They know New York. They know Hollywood. They know Las Vegas. They know Miami. They don't really think of Chicago. And uh, two names w- would come up. I go, when you hear Chicago, does anything even come to mind? Michael Jordan 
and Al Capone were the only two answers that I got. If it wasn't for those two people, no one in Europe would know what the fuck Chicago is. That, that, in, in, my experience <laughs> of, in my experience of unscientifically surveying people at bars in, in London and Paris, that's what I came up with, right? Wow. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I started my fight career in Chicago. Did you? Did you? Well, yep. let, let's, let's, I want to give you a formal introduction first here, but, but I'm going to share a really brief story, guys. You know, I, I, I'm in my mid forties now. I'm acting like a young kid out here, having fun on social media, doing this podcast. I have this rejuvenation. I've talked in the past about buying my second home in Los Angeles and how it's really just given me a pep in my step of everything else I'm really trying to do in my life. You know, you, you, you get older and, and you have that, you know, the, the, the monotony uh, of your day to day. And, you know, some people will go in and join an adult, you know, above 40 basketball league or something like that, or a softball league, which really is just, you know, drinking beer. And, you know, you, you try to do things to, to stay and feel young. And a lot of us do it, um, you know, with, 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 with limited success. Uh, I could tell you, I had someone asked me to be in this basketball league. This was before, actually it was during COVID. I don't know how the hell they were, even, I do know how they were doing it. They just ignored, ignored COVID, but, um, <laughs> I was just under the impression because the guy that asked me to do it, I, I just was the, under the impression it was an above 40 league. Fuck. I, I'm out of shape. I barely played basketball. I could get away with it because I'm a big dude, so you hit me in the post. But we get there, and it wasn't an above 40 league. It's like, <laughs> shit, that kid played at the local junior college freaking last year and started at freaking guard, and he started at guard. He's 6'5". Yeah, the, the, yeah, for the record, we're p- playing a bunch of 20-year-olds and their guard is six foot five. Okay, so this is going to be really, <laughs> really freaking pretty. Okay, man. Um, but you know, I uh, how much do you weigh, Pat? Uh, right now, I'm right at about two hundred pounds. Um, and I've got some extra fat that that I can lose, which I will. But uh, yeah. more than anything else, I'm I'm re- I feel really strong right now. I feel I feel really strong. Well, well and I've given Randy Couture. I gave Randy Couture the the designation of the only guest I've ever had on that, that could kick my ass. Now, you know, you're a few years older than Randy and I think a little bit smaller. I'm I not going to think Randy's actually, Randy's actually older than me. Is he? Oh shit. Yeah. Man, if I yeah. gave Randy, if I gave Randy the nod, I guess I'll give you the nod to Pat. I mean, that's kind of <laughs> fucked up. Kind of fucked up. They'd want to beat me up. I'm just so how tall are you? I, dude, I'm six, five, two eighty, bro. Wow. Six, five, yeah. two. Well, I can outrun you. <laughs> I could, out, I could outdo a lot of things to me. I could guarantee you this. So, <laughs> so our guest today, guys, is is fifty seven years old. Old. He was um, a champion in the UFC even prior to Dana White days. Um, he's had a beef with Dana, just like Randy did. It sounds like I'm gonna get to ask him a little bit of background background on that. Got fired from his broadcasting position, and it was part of that cancel fucking culture. Now. You know, I'm going to challenge him a little bit. He he was present on January 6th, and th- this led to it. So if this shit's not true, you know, what were you doing there January 6th is, is going to be one of my questions. So so start thinking yeah. about that one, Pat. Now I can All say right. what the fuck I want because we are doing this through a computer and you're not right next to me. So so I might talk a little shit. Um, but but what's, what's super interesting, though, about Pat is that uh, – and by the way, guys, everyone fucking relax. I own three units in the Trump Tower – if I were to say pick a side, I would definitely be moderately conservative. Okay, so just everyone fucking relax if they're thinking, "Well, what the fuck, John? I thought you were a Republican. Are you a liberal now?" No, I'm I'm not. But I don't I don't hate them either, though. I think I look at things a little bit differently than a lot of people. I'm a big fan of Barack Obama for for the record. Pat Militich, former UFC champion, former broadcaster that got terminated. The cancel culture got him. Pat Militich, welcome to 2000% Race. Well, thank you, John. Thanks yeah. for having me on, brother. And um, when it came to the January 6th thing that you were mentioning, a good friend of mine who's a real estate guy, he's a, he's a motivational speaker, he's a hypnotist, a guy I respect a lot. He used to train with me. He was a really good fighter, actually, and wrestled for Purdue, Purdue University. So anyway, he said, hey, man, do you want to go out to Washington, D.C. on January 6th? He's like, I just want to be there to observe. And I go, yeah, let's go check it out. It seems like my intuition is telling me we we want to at least be there because there's some historical stuff going on right now in this country. Yep. And basically a million people from my – I've been in a lot of big football stadiums, and it looked like easily 10 football stadiums. Wow. 
um, of people. And we weren't even there to listen to Trump. Trump started speaking. We walked away. We just strolled down the street and walked to the Capitol and stood down on the uh, on the sidewalk there. And we were just observing things that were going on. Mm. Yeah, there was no violence or anything like that. And then they opened the barricades and the crowd started going up the hill. And I looked at my friends who were there and we shook our head and went, nope, this is too obvious. Something is up. Something okay. is not right about this. Okay. And so the crowd then got hit with grenades and rubber bullets and all kinds of stuff. And I think that agitated them. Uh, but there were definitely some... I think there were some paid actors in the crowd. We saw a few people that definitely, um, you know, dressed in black with baseball bats in their backpacks, stuff like that, that weren't, they weren't there to be peaceful. Got it. And uh, so anyway, uh, we didn't go up. We, I didn't set one foot on even a step of that building. I didn't do any of that shit. By the way, that's interesting that you just said, and f f fair is fair, right? We all give Antifa a hard time doing stuff in the name of Black Lives Matter when it's a bunch of 20-year-old white kids from Wisconsin. Now they're Antifa people. But you're you're saying you saw actors like that that were on the Trump side. Well, there, I, think, I, I look, I know I have worked with and I have friends who are former military intelligence, former special forces, guys that were running guerrilla operations against no. each other in South America, uh, very high level guys to destabilize governments in South America. Okay. I know I know what I see when I see it, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And they're very likely, I'm not gonna guarantee it, but they're definitely most likely paid actors within the BLM movement and the Antifa movement and all of it that are causing it's it's all about optics, what you see, how to stir up emotion in the American people. You're, right? say, you're saying the BLM sent people there. Your, your hunch is that you, more than a hunch. No, it, no, I'm saying that I'm saying that there are organizations who have a lot of money who will pay people to go into movements. Yeah, right, 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 and and, and for for the purpose of causing problems and optics and things like that. Right, right. I think the American people. I think the American people are so trusting of the systems and things like that that we are within um, that it wouldn't even cross their mind that all of this stuff goes on. Right. We've been doing this, you know, governments have been doing this stuff for years. Well, I think Antifa and BLM, it's been, I don't know, at least in, in my accounts, proven that, that that they were doing stuff like that. But but you're saying, though, that you saw people doing this as Trump supporters. Are you saying BLM sent people to pretend they're Trump supporters and act like that? Well, there's footage of people that have been speakers at other major events outside of the the whole Trump movement thing who were, you know, photographed being within the crowd. And, gotcha. Um, even in the even in the Capitol. Gotcha. I'm saying this is that, you know, when guys like Soros take seventeen billion dollars and put it in a trust for leftist organizations to use, we've got a major problem. Right. And we've got a major problem on the right, too. Yeah. Um, you know, we've just got people are, you know, this left right narrative um, where Americans need to go. We're all being played by the system. Right. Yep. I mean, when your water goes bad, which we've got horrible, horrible water quality in, in the United States right now, yep. um, the, they're not they're not poisoning the left or the right. They're poisoning all of us. Right. Yeah, I like the analogy. With, with really, yeah with really, really bad water, right? Yep. And air quality and soil quality and all of it, right? So that's what I try to get through to people. I'm about people's health. Mm -hmm. Because if I can help if I can help people get healthy, um, then they're able to help others. Right. Okay. That's that's what I'm about. I'm about talking to farmers about their soil. I'm about talking to human beings about why they have illness, that there is no such thing as disease. There are only manifestations of inflammation within the body. Okay. That they manifest in different ways. It might manifest, you know, like it did with me, respiratory disease my whole childhood that I had to figure out how to heal myself. And it could um, uh, manifest in uh, arthritis or digestive issues for you or anything else. Okay. Right. So that's what I'm about. Let, let me, I'm let not me, about let me chime politics in. or any of this. I got gotcha. you. OK, so because, OK, I'm glad I'm glad we kind of digressed there where, where you where you said all that, because it's like, all right, you're there for the shit show January 6th. OK, well, yeah, I might have known it was going to be a spectacle, too, but I didn't I didn't fly out there. OK, you're you're active. Uh, you're, you're an activist, for lack of a better word, I, I would say, an environmental 
good water for everybody issues. I thought you were making an analogy to bad water and politics, actually. Uh, so, That's a good one, though. Exactly. So, 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 so you're you're active from that standpoint, which obviously po- politics would 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 play a role in. And um, and also the health and the digestive thing, things you talked about. So so that that's what you're about in this context. And now you're wrapped into the January sixth. What's it called? The insurrection? Is that what we call it? Whatever happened? Yeah, January 6th. yeah. No. It's, I make jokes about this all the time. It's like, yeah, uh, um, you know, I had a news guy, a local news guy, young twenty four year old kid, yeah. go. So what part did you play in the insurrection? I go, you understand that a million people were in Washington, D.C. There were no guns. Yeah. There was no insurrection. There was a certain group of people who made a really stupid mistake by following certain people into that building. That's yeah. what they did. Yeah. They really Gosh. lock, stock, and barrel, man. They fell for it, you know, hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. And so, look, um, those people got in trouble. I get it. That's, you know, you don't break windows on a federal building. You don't go in. That's not right. what you do. Yep. Um, so, but, um, I gotta yeah, say the guy. I got to say something, man, because it's always bothered me about this. Because I, I do, I watch it on the news. I see the same thing everyone else is seeing. Let's, let's remember, there was, a, there was I don't know why I pointed out myself with this. I didn't get shot. But, but there was a person that got killed that day that was unarmed by, by, by a guard. Oh, they deserve to. They deserve to. But. And listen, there probably is people that led that charge that that deserved to get killed. And I don't know if the person that got killed was, was one of them or not. But you get that mob mentality where everyone just starts following where we're going. You know, yeah. You ever you ever been at like a big concert or something that starts raining and you have no idea where the exit is, but everyone's walking that way. You have no idea if you're going the right way or not. You know what I mean? And yeah, it's easy yeah. for us to all sit back here. Oh, what a fucking bunch of morons! And you know, if you're in the middle of that thing. I don't know, man. I, I I don't know. So anyhow, well, the thing you know, and there, there were people from all over the country asking me for pictures, things like that. There were people of all walks of life who were there. I mean, there were even foreigners there. Okay, there was people there from Israel. There was people all from all over the world, and they recognized you because you, you're you're outspoken. Not not just so this though, but you had been you you've been on like news channels. Like they recognized others. me. They recognized me. I think more from my fight career, coaching, and broadcasting. Okay, gotcha. And so that's you know, and um, gotcha. But you you so, you but, you you being talked about on Fox News and CNN and stuff though, that was after this. You weren't like a regular like talking head on any of those stations or anything previous. No, no. I mean, I had been on like the Blaze TV years ago. Okay, uh, you know, talking, talking to them about certain things, and I, right. I can, I can talk geopolitics with the best of them. I know we for ten years. I was doing a podcast. We were talking to military, former military intelligence. We were talking to research scientists, economists. Okay, a lot of people who were really painting the the real picture, right? The real picture Got of it. what was going on in the world. Yep, and so. Um, yeah, so I have no problem, you know, holding those conversations, but yeah. I I hold those when I hold those conversations, I don't talk about left and right paradigm. This is this is all deliberate. It's it's driven to cause emotional um, you know, and then we see the dehumanization stuff. When you use terms that are dehumanizing about any group, that always the dehumanization process is what always precedes genocides and wars. Mm-hmm. Always. Right, the cancel culture always precedes genocide okay. and war. Yep. So you have to be very careful where you tread when you um, are being programmed to hate someone based on their skin p- pigmentation, their religion, anything about them that makes them different from you. That because makes- ultimately, we are very alike. We have a few differences, and that's it. Yeah. So we just have to. We have to be very positive. We have to understand that we, you know, that's what I'm about. I, I want to see sick people get well, right? And I learned that at a very early age, how to heal myself. And I learned how to turn really good athletes into world-class athletes by what I taught them and what I put in their bodies, what I what I taught them about um, antioxidants and, and organic concentrated supplements that you cannot find on store shelves. This shit is whole, whole different level stuff, right? Uh- and, and so if you want a machine to operate at optimum level to do things that other humans cannot do, mm-hmm. you have to put these substances in your body. And that's why I'm in what, in the business that I am of talking to farmers about why they're sick and why veterans are sick. Okay. 
why mankind is so sick. You know, mm-hmm. this is the first generation of Americans that are not going to live as long as their parents. Yeah. That says volumes about mm-hmm. our ecological poisoning and then the industry that is healthcare because they're not doing their job. Wow. That's something, man. That's something. I, I, you know, my mom passed at 64 and I'm 46. Am I included in this generation? Oh, fuck, I got to. I gotta go do some. I gotta do start to start doing some bucket list shit. Not not to make light of this, but but if that fact is is true, bro, you know. Well, I read a book. I read a book many many years ago. Now, of course, I've read a lot of books, but this book's this book was very powerful. It's called Dead Doctors Don't Lie, and in that book, he talks about he he had done more autopsies on zoo animals and human beings that that had died of natural causes than any other pathologist. Really, and when he got done, uh, when he came to the conclusion that every single creature that dies of natural causes dies from mineral deficiencies. Period. End of story. You don't, you don't, you don't conduct electricity correctly anymore. Your cells don't work anymore. Your body's failing at a cellular level, and you deteriorate and come apart. Right? You you cannot find these nutrients on store shelves. You can't go to GNC and find this level of stuff that we're supposed to have in our bodies. Right? You just can't do it. But there are people who do understand it, and I've researched this stuff for 35 years, and I talk to a lot of guys that are soil reclamation experts, ag experts, uh, homeopathic doctors, people mm-hmm. like that, that literally when you look at the programs for healing soil, crops, honeybees, human beings, livestock, livestock, we all literally need the same stuff, the, those concentrated organic substances that make life possible and yep. that you can excel, that you can become a real life X-Men. You don't mm-hmm. have to have arthritis. You don't have to have, you know, digestive issues. You don't have to have asthma. Mm-hmm. None of it. You don't have to have any of it. Yep. Wow. You know, I have um, one of my followers actually on Instagram. I, I won't say her last name, but she lives down in Texas and that's Kimberly. Um, is just on me all the time. She mailed me a bunch of shit to say, take a cap of this mineral and mix it with water every freaking day. And I never do it. And every time I'm sick, she'll post on Instagram, I'm sick. She goes, you're not taking your minerals. You're not taking your minerals. And you're now the second person I've ever heard talk about this. I don't know if you believe in taking it as a supplement like that or not, but I, maybe off camera. That's what it, that you have to, because yeah. our soil has been so destroyed by, by, you know, in the 70s, they had what was called the Green Revolution, okay. right? In the 30s, in 37, I think it was, was the dust bowl. Farmers irresponsibly farming killed the soil. It turned to dust and it blew away, yeah. buried entire towns, yep. right? So through chemicals, synthetic chemicals, uh, petroleum-based fertilizers, you grow synthetic plants, okay. right? They're not real plants. It's not real food. Right. So once those plants grow, they're very sick and they're very vulnerable. Nature will kill sick plants, right? Anything that's weak is going to die. So then they come in with failed antibiotics like pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, and they have to disinfect the soil. They have to kill the soil and make it so that nature no longer exists in that field so that those plants won't die. Yep. Because normal plants, if you grow something biologically with no chemicals, with high-grade nutrients, it has the natural enzymes that fends off bugs. Bugs won't eat it because they have the defense mechanisms, Right. Fungus won't kill them. They protect themselves, right? And you put down cover crops so that you don't have weed issues. Yeah. You know, it's it's, it's a lot of that type of farming, right? Shit, man. This is good. I, I didn't know I was going to get get this kind of gem out, out of this interview, man. Thank, thank you for that. I hope people are paying attention. Yeah. So, you know, if, if uh, you know, I'd love for you to, uh, you know, I'll get you some product, whatever. But, you know, the thing is, is, we have to understand. So most people go to a store and they'll buy vitamin mineral supplement, right? Mm-hmm. Like, well, most of those are all synthesized. They're created in laboratories. Okay. They're not even real. Mm. So they're, you're not going to use them. And actually, they're actually detrimental to your cellular and mitochondrial function. Interesting. So when you put substances in your body like antioxidants, antioxidants have the ability to raise oxygen levels in your cells, which is super important. Yep. They have the ability, they have the ability to feed your mitochondria, which is the furnace of the cell, and generate a ton of energy. So you feel energetic all day long and you can go, go, go. 
And then the last thing they'll do when they leave is they'll bind with synthetic chemicals, heavy metals, and, and garbage that doesn't belong in your cell, and your cell will then release it and get rid of it. So now you're replacing all the garbage with high-grade, God-given, God-created, universe-created organic nutrients and removing the man-made garbage that's making you sick to begin with. Wow. Right? Okay. That is the key to, that is literally the key to um, health. And that, I learned that in my early 20s. It's the only reason I won a world title. Uh, probably the only reason I've ever accomplished anything because I probably would be dead from respiratory disease wow. long ago. Wow. So do you feel like, so So you started doing it way back then. Do you think for people that are maybe in their 50s now that haven't, it could kind of turn into like a little bit of a fountain of youth effect for them? I see it happen every day. Really? Really? Every day. What do you, 100%. What's your thought on the increased popularity? And the only reason I even know what this is, I, I get accused of it all the time. I'm not doing it though. What What is, and not that it's something bad to do, but uh, the increased popularity lately of uh, testosterone uh, replacement therapy. Well, the thing is, is, you know, you got 25 year olds mm -hmm. that are going for this, right? Yeah. You don't. So if your body's operating optimally, you don't need it. Right. You don't, you don't need it. Yeah. Men, men that live in the Himalayan foothills father children into their late eighties and early nineties because they still operate correctly because they eat food out of soil that is super mineral rich, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So m imagine 90 year olds are still getting the hard ons over there and doing, doing what they got to do. <laughs> like that's, that's incredible. Yeah. Right. That's, that's unheard of in America. Right. You know, so, so the, but the 25 year old of today, the average male has the same testosterone levels of a 70 year old in the year 2000. Now go back another 20 years and then another 20 years. So as our soil has been destroyed, our food has been destroyed, and therefore we have been destroyed. So all of our operating systems, our hormone levels, all of it, right? Holy shit. And and, and, and here I was uh, blaming it on uh, sub other substances entering my body or excessive alcohol usage over, over the years. And I got to tell you, man, you know, and I, I was going to go a different direction with this. That was super valuable information. I. Here's how I look at it, people. You get guys in their 50s or even their 40s that start doing this shit, and then they get addicted to it where they start doing too damn much because they love the impact on it. And, dude, when you were in your 20s, you weren't as big as you are now. You know what I mean? And it's it's so clear. I, I always like, okay, if you're going to do testosterone replacement therapy, dude, take it to the levels that you're supposed to be at. <laughs> Don't start straightening it like a freaking steroid cycle, you asshole. That's that's not testosterone replacement therapy. And what's funny for me, Pat, is just because I do so much on Instagram now and and I've gotten like you know a popular following and people didn't know me before, the haters will come on and accuse me of that shit. I go, motherfucker, go look at pictures of me when I was twenty five. Go look at pictures of me when I was thirty five. I've always been this big. It has nothing to do with with anything. Well, because you've been on steroids the whole time. You seeing a motherfucker on steroids for twenty years that still has hair like this? I mean, let let's be serious, okay? So, Look at that. Look, this is thick. Dude, that's pretty freaking impressive. And you got you're over ten years older than me, man. That's that's awesome. But but let's um let's circle back, bro, to, to what we were talking about earlier. I, I totally took us down down a different path, but you know, it kind of I think it kind of all blends together a little bit because you know the 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 culture when all the blm stuff started happening i shouldn't say the blm stuff i should say not the blms i'd say i'd say the division just division yeah right? and, and i think i think the media reporting i'm not saying it's the media's fault but i'm saying the media reporting as they were going all the way back to mike brown and trayvon martin and then just the way it was excessively um you know, and I, and I believe that there was a place for it. I, I got to tell you, Laquan McDonald in, in Chicago, fucking Chicago, fucking police try to, as far as I'm concerned, try to cover that fucking shit up. And, and they tried to sweep it under the fucking rug. And that shouldn't have fucking happened. And that kid has a pretty bad past where he didn't have a lot of opportunities in his fucking life. And that ain't what the police are there for. They're, they're there to protect that kind of kid. You know what I mean? Now, right. you have other situations, you know, like the stuff in Minneapolis, for instance, there wasn't corruption across the police force or some cover up. There was a couple bad actors, you know what I mean? And yeah, and that's that's not in my eyes, bro, 
something to riot over. I think the Laquan McDonald thing, yes, let's protest over that. And if it leads to riots, it leads to riots. But but some of these other things, it's like, wait a minute. And even going back all the way to Mike Brown, you know, say what you want. He was a criminal. He was a thug or or, or whatever. Mike Brown's like Rosa Parks. Like he he symbolized, he was the straw that broke the camel's back. There was already a lot of fucking racial tension um, outside of St. Louis or, or, or wherever, wherever that was. Yeah, yeah. Um, Down at so, Ferguson, yeah. Yeah. And, there, you know, yeah. and the, the, so the thing is, is, so I've trained law enforcement and military for three decades, right? Okay. And I've watched, I watched budgets start to get cut. So law enforcement, for instance, you know, those guys have to recertify with their firearms constantly. Okay. What do you think is the average amount of hours a law enforcement department or officer will get in training in terms of hands-on? <laughs> I, 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 hands -on. Yeah. So something not enough, obviously. I, I wouldn't even Four know. hours. Four hours. Four hours a year. Wow. Four hours a year. Wow. So you got, so you have people who many times are, are scared. They're carrying a gun into a fight. Yep. And a tool belt. And- they're scared yeah. because they were not given, you know, the proper amount of money, yeah. training, and things like that. Look, when I was young, cops were big, big dudes, like around where I lived, and they didn't put up with any shit, and everybody respected them. Yeah. But they weren't bad. They weren't bad people, right, um, at all. And I just had a cop from Davenport, Iowa, come up to me. I haven't seen him in years. Yep. He goes, hey, man, I just wanted to say hi to you. Thank you for the training that you gave us because- you saved my ass on numerous occasions because I came and trained with you as much as I did. Yeah. In hairy situations, I was able to save my own ass and probably, to be honest with you, save a lot of other people's asses mm. from getting hurt. Okay. Right? Yeah. That's what it's about. Yeah. It's, a, it's about being so good at what you do mm. um, that you, God forbid, would even ever have to use your gun. Yeah. You're so good at what you do. Well, right? Yep. Getting situations under control with these. I love right? it. Yeah. Wow. And if you're not confident with these and you're not world class with these, you know, being in sticky situations is a really, really dangerous thing for everybody. Right. You know, and so I'm I'm a big proponent of law enforcement. I've tried to help cops as long as as long as I have uh, because I was given knowledge. Right. Yeah. And 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 I love helping military. I've, I've been blessed to work with very the highest level military guys on the planet. These guys are. Like you don't want them hunting you. Let's put it that way. All right. Okay. Uh, but but that's what this is about. And as society gets more savage, we see it every day. Law enforcement is being having its legs ripped out from underneath it. Right. So it's 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 a tough situation all around. But I saw it by design. The budget's being cut for these this type of stuff, and went. It's just too obvious. That was twenty five years ago. Wow. My progress. Wow. Right. You know, so defund the police has been going on for a quarter century. Wow, that's that's uh, that that's interesting. Any like anyone that didn't see this comment, knowing what you knew twenty five years ago, you're looking at this now like, uh, duh, what the fuck do you think was going to happen? You know, well, that's like the you know the situation. So when we go back to health, right? Yeah. Um, in the nineties, I was teaching kids karate and kids kickboxing. I had classes of 80, 90 kids, right? Just I love kids. I love working with kids. And boys started being brought to me with this thing called autism. And I would say, okay, okay, but what's causing it? It doesn't just happen, right? And so at that time, it was what, one in 10,000 boys had it? Now, now we're at one in 36. You know, oh, is that a spectrum with autism? Really? One in 36? Yes. Really? Autism. Autism, yeah. So, um, we have to understand that environmentally, environmentally, people are being affected. Children are being affected. Not only brain function, physical function, hormonal levels, proper hormone levels for testosterone, estrogen, all those things that are so important um, for proper development of children is not happening like it like it used to. Do you, do you feel like a proponent, or excuse me, an, op an opponent of you on that that topic would would say it's it's being di diagnosed more accurately now or wider spread, not not an actual changing condition. It couldn't be misdiagnosis because these kids would be in the mirror like this. Okay. Right. You know. Yeah. That's it's yeah, it was definitely not misdiagnosis. It is it is the increase in in 
um, pollutants in our environment and potentially the schedule. Holy shit. The children are in right? powerful shit, man. You need a damn... Okay, I, uh, listen, you need a damn flat. You, you, you're going to say it's a big time shit here, man. And first of all, I want to make one quick point. You know, sometimes these social policy types of issues back backfire in our face. You know what I mean? So 25 years ago, they were like, hey, let's take money from training and cops because we want to fuck up our world in three fucking decades. No, that money was going to be used somewhere else. And whoever was doing it at the time probably thought it was a good idea. And there's a lot of social policy types of issues like that. The one that comes immediately com uh, uh, to mind is go take a drive through Chicago on the near north side. What you're going to notice is lounges and restaurants where the Cabrini Green housing project used to be. And you're going to see million dollar condos now. OK, and they it took them, you know, how many ever years to realize, OK, taking a bunch of poor people and putting them in high rise buildings made out of cement is is probably not going to be a good idea. But it took 30 years <laughs> it, took, it took 30 years for them to come to that conclusion you know what i mean um yeah. you know yeah so um let, let's let's fucking beat a dead horse let's take a dead horse and kick it in the fucking ribs pat wh wh what's your position what's your position on the on the, on the vaccines <laughs> <laughs> i started so i started researching that stuff a uh, quarter of a century ago okay right so after healing myself 35 years ago, I started asking a lot of questions, right? Because nobody could nobody could solve my respiratory problems. Nobody knew what they were doing. The best of the best, supposedly. Okay. Couldn't figure it out, right? I went, so now imagine the light bulb that goes on for me where I can spar with world-class boxers at the time about three to four rounds before I was suffocating and just couldn't do any more. But I wanted to be great. I wanted to be a world champ. And I trained with, you know, Pena's Boxing in downtown Davenport, Iowa. That produced Michael Nunn, Antoine Eccles, a lot. Michael Nunn was the best pound for pound boxer in the world for four, four years straight. Wow. He's a friend of mine. So 10 days later, after I started putting these products in my body, 10 days later, I went from breathing through a straw that was full of mucus to breathing through what it felt like a giant PVC tube that was totally clear. And all of a sudden, I can do 10, 12 rounds with these guys all day, oh, every day. Shit. Wow. And and so that changed my perspective, right? So that's what I just want to do that for people. But the light bulb that goes off for me is I'm suddenly um, at 5'10", walking around 192 pounds, bench pressing, you know, 375 pounds, dunking basketballs and running a 4'440". Four, 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 four? And beating- <laughs> What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> and beating, but I was beating, I was beating cross country, college cross country teams in trail races. Wow. I could fly. I could fly. I could run 10 miles, like flying. Dude, you, you're, Austin Eckler is a starting running back for the Chargers. I had him on the show. I bet you're faster than him. And the only reason I say that is because when I asked him his 40 time, he wouldn't tell me. He said, I haven't ran a 40 since high school. Okay. That means like four or five. Okay. Let's moving on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it's, that's the, that's what humans are intended to do. We're intended to be very powerful, mm -hmm. very good runners, um, and intelligent and aware, right? Which, so I started researching, you know, 25 years ago. You don't have to be a doctor to research and read data and analyze what you're seeing, right? You don't have to be that intelligent uh, to figure things out. And when I came to the conclusion that I came to 25 years ago, I went, nope. None of it. Wow. None of it. So you didn't take one. None you didn't it. even take the original vaccine or the booster. Which one? The one or the original? The oh, the, the first. No. And then the obviously you never take the boosters, but you didn't even take the you didn't even take the first one. You know, I got stuck, bro. I was in the um. My daughter didn't want to take it. My daughter's mom's family is they're Greek and they were very anti-vaccine. And I had a pissing match, man. We had to go. I was on this TV show called Below Deck on Bravo, and they flew us out. And this was actually after the pandemic was fucking over, but they were still making us show our fucking boosters and vaccines. And, you know, so I made my kids take it. And hopefully I'm not paying for this in 15 years, man. I mean, here's 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 what's super important. Here's what's super important. These are facts. Um, and only because of my experiences and observations, which were, which the road had to start somewhere with me 
healing myself to become a world champion because I was just tired of not being able to breathe. But that started me on a journey into a lot of stuff, into a lot of research. I've always been a researcher, right? Our DNA is God's signature on us. Altering our DNA, which has been going on for a long time. You know, you can listen to my interview with Dr. Will Spencer, who's a, a genetic genius, has been assisting human beings in fixing their DNA for 15 years, right? He can reverse GMOs. Our DNA is the signature of our creator. That has to remain intact. mRNA technology is intended to alter your DNA. And I don't want my DNA altered. I want to stay. I want to stay just as I was born. Uh, and who I am, man, yeah. and who I am. Well, I, th I, I think a lot of us, a lot of us young bucks in our in our forties would, would like to be in your condition at fifty seven. So, so your 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 DNA is something to be to be uh, to be said. And let's end it with this, man. We ask everybody. Pat Militich recommends what movie to the two thousand percent raise audience? Uh, Raging Bull, man. Raging Bull. Boom, dude! I love it, man. I love it. You know, people think, you know, especially my, especially my age and younger, people think of Joe Pesci and Roger Robert De Niro like fucking Goodfellas was their first okay. movie. Go watch Raging Bull. Love yeah. it, my man. Thanks, Thanks thank you. Let's go. That concludes another episode of Two Thousand Percent Raise with your host John Sarasani. Make sure you're following on all social media platforms. Chai.